On your life. All right, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Tuesday night Bible study. Tuesday night Bible study. We are in Genesis 24. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for a beautiful day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. And thank you for this beautiful, wonderful book Amen. that tells us all the good things uh, that we need to know for living the Christian life and then some. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would just open up our, our hearts as teachers and the people's hearts uh, as listeners and learners. And uh, Father, may it all be for your glory. And uh, God, just may we be open channels for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I got the end of the prayer. Amen. All right, we're going to start with Genesis 24. This is the longest chapter that we have encountered so far. It goes on and on and on and on, and was, it has 67 verses in it. Yeah. And that means I've got about a minute per verse. Per verse. Ah, that's a different thing. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read a few, talk about them, read a few more, and get as far as we can, rather than trying to read the whole thing through like I do sometimes. That's probably good. All right. So let's start in verse 1. Uh, and Abraham was old. Now remember last chapter, we buried Sarah. Sarah was 127 years old when she died, which means that Abraham was how old? Uh, ten, 10 years different. 137. 30, 30. Don't do math. Okay. So he dies at 175 in chapter 25. So when it says he's old and well stricken in age, we know he's between 137 yep. and 175. It doesn't matter where you're at in that. You are old and well stricken in age. It says, And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, uh, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land, must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. That's right. So a few things here. We just talked about the age of Abraham. Isaac was born when Abraham was 100. So that means that uh, Isaac is somewhere between 37 and 75. My guess is he's closer to the 37-year range. Because if you remember a lot from the Bible readings earlier, how old the people would be whenever they would get married, a lot of times it was around your 40s and your 50s and, and things like that. Okay, So I'm thinking that he's, he's not 75. I'm thinking Isaac is closer to the 37. So this would have been right after Sarah died. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a proof text on that. The very last verse in uh, verse 67, the very last part says, And Isaac was comforted, comforted after his mother's death. So he was still in mourning during this period. So I think that Isaac is probably about 37 years old. Yep. All right. Uh, it says in verse 1, And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. <laughs> That's an understatement. That is an understatement. Yeah, this was just God's, this is the Holy Spirit's way of saying, I keep my word. I keep my promises. I promise back in chapter 12, we've been at Abraham for 12 chapters now. Back in chapter 12, I would bless him. And now the Holy Spirit is saying, oh, by the way, I did. I did. I blessed him. I kept my word. Kept his word. He always does. He always does. All right, now, verse 2. And Eleazar said unto his eldest servant of his house. Now. What? Not Eli And Abraham, not Eleazar. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking out loud and reading. Yeah, you are. I'm feeling a little bit of rush because there's 67 verses. <laughs> Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house. Look at 15 verse 2. I was going to say, who do you think that is? Since who? you gave the answer. Since I gave the answer. Way back when, in chapter... 
15, we'll look at verse 1. Mm -hmm. uh, after these things, after the battle of the nine armies, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Yeah. Now, I figure that if I was going to be the steward, like this guy was, the steward of, of, of his house, at the time that this happened, Abraham was somewhere between 75 years old and 85 years old. And he has Eleazar of Damascus as the steward of his house. Eleazar is probably what? 40-ish. You know, 60. Somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. We don't know. He's an old, responsible man. All right. Well, now... Could be 30, though. Could be 30. That would be better. Now, um, if, you, if you think that Abraham was about 80 at this point, this is 57 years later. So if Eliezer was 60, now he's like 120. Yeah. I don't think that he's fit for the trip. Well, they lived to be older back then. I don't know. I don't know. What I'm saying... He's riding a camel. So here's the point. is We're reading through all of chapter 24. First off, there's no mention of Eliezer uh, dying in here. Right. So we don't have... We, we don't know. We don't know. He could have been a servant. He could have passed away. There's no record of him. Yep. Blah, blah, blah. This we could think. be a new guy. So... But we think it's him. But we think it's Eleazar from 15 verse 2. But he'd be, he'd be, he would be near a 100 at the best. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm going to throw something out here that I don't... I don't... Mm, okay. So... Let's just say that this guy here is the servant, okay? Yeah. And Abraham sends his servant to get a bride for his son. And what does that remind us of? Holy Spirit and Jesus. That's right. The father sends the Holy Spirit to get a bride for Jesus. Yes. Okay? That is pointed out. All in over the every commentator, every commentator, and every they all get that one. They all get that one. However, I will say this: one of the great ways to get into error in the Bible is to look at a picture and go, "You know what? That seems like the Father sending the Spirit to get Jesus a bride." But nowhere does the Bible let's just say force that. it into there. But then we can force it in there. Yeah. And 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 I'm going to I'm going to show you some points as we go through, but that is a good way to end up in error. Yeah. Because you cannot push that unless God well, says that this is a type of that. Yeah, cuz what they do is they put stuff into the allegory and that's that's okay. But then they start taking stuff out. They start drawing conclusions from it. And you can't do and that. And that's when you get into all sorts of error. You can't do it. So so there's a thought that Abraham and Sarah represents God the Father and his wife, the wife of Jehovah, which is the Old Testament way of viewing things. And then Isaac and Rebekah represent Jesus and the bride in the New Testament. But again, it's without foundation. It's just reading into it and seeing some parallels be careful that is not how you do bible study nope that is a if you, i'm not going there you've got to compare spiritual things with spiritual which means that god has to give you the definitions if god doesn't call it a type it's not a type better be really careful because i think it's probably not a it's type. probably not a type or else you would have called it that yeah all right so for instance this first part abraham who would be god the father says unto his eldest servant the holy spirit Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I'll make thee swear. Well, that's not... You can't make the Holy Ghost swear to God the Father that I'm... You can't... It's ridiculous. It's stupid. All right, so we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. All right, Bible believers. You should have never brought that up. We, no, it's because we're teaching. <laughs> we're teaching, right? No. And, and that's it's, like when, when it's, Joe, people make Joseph the type of Jesus. And there's nothing in the Bible Move. that says that. I think it's type you of the Antichrist. You can't do it. You, there's people that make uh, Noah... Uh, the type of the pre-tribulation rapture. It doesn't say it's that. It's not in there. It doesn't say All right. Anyway, we'll keep going. 
And Abraham said unto his elder servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. So this is the guy who is his chief steward, makes all the decisions. He rules. Right. He says, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Now that is an odd thing. We don't do it nowadays. I don't think that Nat goes into his workplace and the managers <laughs> say, hey, do that. There's all kinds of lawsuits and things that could happen. But, but in their old days, that was a way of recognizing authority. I dug up an old rabbi from, he lived between 1089 and 1167 AD. So he's like over a thousand years ago. And he said that this means uh, the thigh, literally put your hand under his thigh, for a man put his hand under the one who ruled him, meaning, if you are really under my authority, prove it, show it to me. And Abraham sat in a position of authority, and his servant put his hand just under his thigh. Uh, and he also said that it w they still did that back then in India. He said that hmm. custom was still in existence around 1000 AD. Hmm. So we don't do it today. It's kind of awkward. but. But back then they did. And so Abram says, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, and thou shalt not that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now if you remember the Canaanites, we listed them. Oh, there's so many of them. Jebusites and Hittites and back in Genesis ten in verses fifteen through nineteen. And those were the children of Canaan, who were the children of Ham, who was the children of Noah. Okay, so they were uh, the family of Ham. And they usually had some really bad uh, religious practices. They were badly pagan. They were badly pagan. And so Abraham said, no, 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 no. And this is why he says, I want you to swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of earth. I want you to recognize there's only one God. There's only one God. Don't get my son a wife from these people that don't believe there's one God. Okay, And he's also making reference to the Lord God who promised him that his children would be like the stars of heaven and the dust of earth. So there's a lot of different references going on here. Um, verse 4, But thou shalt go unto my country, which was Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Back then, of course, the parents would choose uh, they would choose the the bride for their for their son. And so uh, Abraham is really too old to make the journey, yeah. and so he's son sending his most trusted servant to do this. It's odd that he waited this long. Just saying. I, again, I think it goes back to we get married around, you know, 20 to 25, but back then they got married around 40 and it was right on time. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Now, the servant, before he swears, before he puts his hand under Abraham's thigh, he says, I got some questions. <laughs> All right. He doesn't swear right away. Uh -huh. I love this. You got this guy here, he's a thinker. That's why he's the eldest servant. That's why he's in charge of everything. He's a thinker. And so he goes, oh, a couple of things. I got some questions. Mm -hmm. And the servant said unto him, peradventure, what if the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land? Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And, Abraham, and Abraham said, well, no, beware that thou bring not my son thither again. Don't take him back home. He's got to stay here. This, this is, is the, the promised, promised land. land. Yeah. He's got to stay. Now, a couple things I need you to, I want to point out right here. I'll just point out one at the moment. The servant says, peradventure, the woman. He didn't say, hey, um, you know, should if, if this one won't come, should I go to the next one? And if that one won't come, should I go to the next one? He, That's a good point. He really believed that he was supposed to find the yeah. appointed one that God had created specifically for Isaac. He really believed in soulmates kind of a thing. And we're going to see that actually in a couple more verses as well. 
And so you'll see he talks about the woman, the woman. It's interesting woman. because Abraham said, take a wife. You yes. Know, but yeah. he's like, no, no, I've already zeroed it in for you. Yeah, he zeroed it in. All right, so let's look at verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, this is Abraham talking, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, number one, he brought me out of Ur, and from the land of my kindred, took me away from my family, also took me away from my country, and which spake unto me, that's huge. But then verse 4, and that swear unto me. Whenever, Remember whenever God said, Ooh. I swear by myself? So Abraham is bringing up these four big things about God. He says, that God uh, who swear unto me, saying, unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. Look at so those. It sounds growth. like he zeroed in too. A wife. Yes. I think he's. I don't think he's saying a in generic. I think he's saying a as in singular. There is one out there, mm-hmm. but also this spiritual growth of Abraham. That yeah. Abraham, he's not freaking out. No. He realized, hey, you know what? God sent his angel before me in Egypt to protect us from Pharaoh. He sent his angel before us to protect us from Abimelech. Yeah. He sent his angels to help me destroy some kings in a fight. God is, and he's like, God will take care of this just like he takes care of everything else. It's faith logic. And one of the coolest things is, as like the RU guy, I mean, we've seen people grow, and then they start applying faith logic mm. in how they go about their business. And that's really cool. It is. It is. Um, all right, verse 8. And if the woman, here's Abraham, and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, Then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. So now they both narrowed in. There's one woman that he's going after. Yeah. And uh, and it's not her sister. It's not her. It's it's her. Now watch, verse 9. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. So now he's like, you know what, I can do this oath. You know, because he was thinking, do I have to kidnap her? You know, what do I got to do? I got to have the details. I've got to have some details. I mean, how am I supposed to perform this oath? What are the conditions of it? Okay, well, you know what? This I can do. If yeah. uh, if I don't have to kidnap anybody, I'm okay with it. No kidnapping. All right. Now, verse 10. We're going to read verse 10 to verse 14. And the servant. Now, before I go much further here, I want you to see something. Verse 2, the eldest servant. Mm-hmm. Verse 5 the servant Mm -hmm. verse 9 the servant and verse 10 the servant okay Um, that's important for something later on and the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed now that makes it look like he went by himself but in verse oh no in verse 32 (laughs) it says uh, that he had men's feet that were with him the Wash the men's feet that were with him. So he went, but he also had men with him. He had guys who were armed to the teeth. He's loaded with engagement presents and yes. jewels and gold. I mean, you know how Abraham is. He walks around with a million dollars cash in his back pocket. Yeah. And this is the chief of his servants. So this guy's going to go with 10 camels, yeah. but there's treasures there. You didn't just go, you didn't just travel back. I mean, not we're going to smart. All right. Because there's thieves. And the, um, and the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. I love that. Gets the told to do something, and he goes, goes and he does it. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose, and he went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. Now that makes it sound like it's a nice, easy trip. It's not. <laughs> it's 1,100 miles. How many miles do you do a day? You know what? Not that many. Uh, it would it would have taken months to do this. And they, yeah. I was reading I was reading someplace, and they said that they would actually winter over. Yes. Because uh, at certain points you, you just can't travel. But now he could have taken a shortcut across the desert, but they probably would have died. <clears throat> and there's a lot of uh, dust storms here, and those are those are more dangerous than thieves. But so he travels up and he goes down through the fertile crescent between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers back to the city of Ur. 
I, I just got to say, you know, if you're trucking back then, you're doing 15, 20 miles a day. Yeah, if you're trucking. I mean, if you were doing 11 miles a day, that's 1,100, it would take you 100 days. Which is a third of a year. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what four you're looking. months. You that's know, it's, it's probably a six-month journey thereabouts. Yeah. You know, you know to go and fetch her. Yeah. So before we get too much farther, <coughs> so so the initial trip going north, um, they're pretty much, they're used to that area because they travel up through Canaan and Haran. Yeah, yeah. They would have trade routes. But then you hit a, a section of, uh, of desert, wilderness, and whatever, and this is where you might think thieves. But once you get here, this is all well-traveled trade routes. Hmm. I made some notes here about Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia. <laughs> okay, um, Ur itself had about 100,000 inhabitants. Now, we've been looking at cities of 500. Mm -hmm. When we talk about like Shechem or whatever, they might have 200 people in it, 300 people in it. They're not big cities. So we're talking about Ur. We've got 100,000 inhabitants. You're going to see towers, temples, law courts, markets, statues, gardens, shrines. There'd be monuments and mosaics. The city itself was divided into rectangular blocks with paved streets that were lined with two-story houses. It had its own seaport and a man-made canal. Uh, they worshipped over 500 different gods and goddesses mm -hmm. but Tira Abraham's dad and the fellow Semites from uh, from Shem remember this is probably where Shem is still around at mm -hmm. they worship the one true God the craziest thing for me is that when you get up into here and you make the trip down he would have passed over 35 ziggurats just here's one there's one as there and it, and those are like these small stepped pyramids and at mm -hmm. the top would be altars to gods and goddesses mm -hmm. so this would be a fascinating trip um, the path they traveled was an established trade route uh, complete with mile markers didn't what? know that mile markers armed patrols nice. river fords there were guard houses occasionally there were food depots and there were also uh, some of these cities were quite large they had secured cities um, only the only serious enemies that this one guy said that they would have encountered would have been disease and dust storms. It would be in the best interests of the cities to make sure that the roads were safe to travel, Same because thing. otherwise you're not going to get trade. People aren't going to bring things to you. Yeah. So it, a city that was smart would have guards posted. Yeah, and it's the same thing that Rome did. You got to have mail back yeah, and mail. forth. So you're going to yeah. have messengers and everything. Mm -hmm. You've got to have roads and whatnot for your army. Civilization. To travel. Civilization. So you can imagine whenever uh, Eliezer comes here, he's like, you know, country mouse in a big city. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a little out. bit. All right. <clears throat> well, he was from Damascus, though. Eli if it was Eliezer, oh. he was of Damascus. So he a knew a big city. A yeah. long time ago. So he knew a big city at one point. All right. And so it says that they went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And that's Ur of the Chaldees. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city, that is to say, outside the city, by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. Which, of course, reminds us of what? How thirsty we are. It sure does. In John chapter 4, the woman at the well was That's at what noon. I was, I, would think, I was thinking of Moses. Really? Yeah. Why? Because in the movie, whenever he... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when he wanders out of the desert, he wanders into the... Mm -hmm. Chuck yeah. the bed. But in John 4, the woman at the well, uh, just as a side note... She, she went out at noon. Because she was a, uh, a woman of ill repute. Yeah, so she had to go out when the other women weren't there. Right. Normally, they would draw in the evening because it's cooler. Who wants to do all their work at noon? Now, I mentioned this thing about the servant... The servant, the servant. I'm the gonna, servant. I'm going to show this picture, but then we're going to move on. I don't know what this means. I just saw it. In verse 2, verse 5, verse 9, verse 10, verse 17, he's called the servant. Hmm. Then he switches to the man in hmm. 21, 22, 26, 29, 30, 32. And then there's a little one later on at 16. 
But after 32, he switches back to the servant in 34, 52, 53, uh, 61 has both, 62, and then 66. So it's like, it's, it's this clear division, but what it means, I have no idea. I just noticed it, and so I'm passing it on. We should speculate. We have time. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so he comes unto the uh, he comes under the well of water at evening time. So it's cool. Uh, they pull up and you know turn off their engines and everything. They they make the camels kneel down. And uh, and in verse twelve it says, and he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham. Mm-hmm. I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass, that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now, if you'll look over at verse 45, this is his recounting of what just happened. He says, And before I had done speaking in mine heart. Amen. People often ask that question. So, can God hear when I pray in my heart? Yes, he can. This whole prayer that we just read was the servant praying in his heart silently silently to the Lord. He didn't make a big fuss about it. It wasn't like he rolled up and he said, Oh, Lord God, I'm going to bless with great riches the first girl who comes to me and feeds my camels. I'm here. I'm here. I'll feed them. It wasn't like that. This was between him and God. I claim it. I claim it. That's right. I claim it. Um, but I, I just thought that was important. Some people off, you know, they do wonder: Does God hear it when you pray silently? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great. That's a great point. I didn't think. I didn't. I missed it. It's the first time that okay. I know of. Here's what I will say. Oh. This was a this was a servant's prayer. He did not pray what we might typically pray, which was, "Dear Lord, uh, bring out a beautiful blonde." Who's about five foot eight, and when I know her, uh, that's the one. Uh, yeah, that's. He that. said, "Bring out the appointed one." He said he he looked for somebody who would meet his needs and who had a servant's heart, because he knew that that would make a good wife for Isaac. Yeah. And uh, and I think that that's a, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, he was looking for a giver, not a taker. And so, let, let's let's look down to verse 15. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking in his heart, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel. Now, that's Mr. Bethuel, oh. son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. And she came out with her pitcher upon her shoulder. The damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also, until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough, (coughs) and ran again under the well to draw water, and drew for all of his camels. Now, now one of the things we're going to see repeated over and over again is this order. He stood by the well. He prayed, let down thy pitcher. This is what he would say to her. Yes. She would say, he would say to her, give me drink. And she would reply, "Drink, and I'll give to your camels also." And so we're gonna we're gonna see that first he prayed it, and now we're actually seeing it. They're by the well. He says to her, "Let down your pitcher, give me drink." She says, "Drink, and I'll give your camels also to drink." Yes. All right. Now 
Uh, I put this together. Does anybody have any idea how much a camel drinks? A lot. Anybody? Especially after a long trip let's, like we've had. Let's play a game called How Much Does a Camel Drink? A, now this is in the number of gallons in three minutes. So we've got nine gallons in three minutes. I'm going to go with the nine. 27 gallons. You're getting ridiculous. In three minutes. 53 gallons in three minutes. 68 gallons one, in three minutes. One camel. This one, is one camel. One camel. One camel. Uh, what? They're, they're not that big. I'm going to go with the... Uh, well, a bath... T I don't know. I'll go with the 27. Think of a 50-gallon fish tank. I can't. A 50-gallon drum with a camel outside of it. They uh, <laughs> they say that a camel can drink 53 gallons in three minutes. Now, what that means to you and me is, is a lot these, of water. these guys probably drank probably 30, okay? But 30 gallons apiece times 10 camels is 300 gallons of water. Until so, they're done drinking. So she comes up. She's got her pitcher on her shoulder. It's a big one. She's got a big pitcher. It's nowhere near this. It's monstrous size, right? <laughs> he says, hey, can I have some a little bit of sip? And she lets it down onto her hand, and she lets him have a little bit of a drink. Now, she, Ryan, this pitcher is big enough because she's taking it back to the house. It's probably a five-gallon. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds, and so this girl is strong. Yeah, it's probably on her head. Yeah. It, no, well, no, it's, it, they usually did on their shoulder. shoulder. Yeah, there's another verse in here. Oh, okay. Um, but, so, yeah, maybe 30 gallons, or um, I'm sorry, uh, 30 pounds, 25 pounds, a lot of weight. It's a lot. Okay. So she goes ahead, she goes, here's a sip, sir. Oh, and I'm going to go ahead and feed or give water to your 10 camels, too, because that only looks like it's about 400 gallons. I got nothing to do all day. It's, it's so she's now I love her part where it says she's probably got to go back and do homework or something. So she's stalling. She's stalling. <laughs> she's stalling. No, my favorite part is verse sixteen. It says the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither she's working out all day. <laughs> she went. She went down to the well, <laughs> oh. filled her pitcher, and then came up. So she went down to fill a pitcher and came up. Went down. Well, came up. Today we're going to start a new cardio class. It's called Camel Cardio. That's right. That's right. Our <laughs> workouts with Rebecca. <laughs> so, so she was a strong. Breathe. <laughs> yeah, she was a strong girl. Um, oh my word! Looking at that same verse, though, the damsel was very fair to look upon. I like this thing. A virgin, neither had any man known her. Yeah. Um, Unlike with lots, kids, that I don't think they were chased yeah. in any way. It chased in any way. Yeah, I think that this is a, a God's way of saying that. Uh, no, really, she was. She was pure. She was pure. Yeah. No one, had, no one had messed with her yeah. because he, he. This is the lineage of Jesus, and so we've got to keep that line straight. That's why that's important. Yeah. So she gives him to drink. She runs up and down the hill, runs up and down the hill, runs up and down the hill, runs up and down the hill. Now look at verse 21. When evening had come, no. <laughs> I know, somewhere around midnight. <laughs> midnight, the woman, no, he says. It doesn't and, say that. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace. See, he's doing he's, the same thing. He's, he's wondering. He, he put out an impossible fleece. He really he's did. Like, he's like. I'm looking for a girl god that that is unmistakable. She has to be kind and hardworking and patient and sweet and pretty and the whole deal. And it says, and the man, now this is the first time that he was called the man. All right. The man, wondering at her, held his peace to wit, this is what he was wondering, whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. To wit means to wonder. To or yeah. No, to this point. He was one he was wondering at her concerning this particular thing. He was wondering at this particular did has God prospered my journey or not? Yeah. Many times we go through that where we pray for something, God answers it, and then we go, Boy, was that God? I don't know if it was God. I don't know if that was God. Would you Man, think that was God? Let's go. We prayed for a woman to come and here's one and she's doing exactly what we asked yeah, and she's just watered yeah. ten camels and Lord, is she the one? All right. <laughs> 
So now, in his mind, in the servant's mind, he's thinking, this could be it. So, (laughs) right, well, obviously. Verse 22, and it says, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight, and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, now watch, okay, this this particular uh, boy, and he said, who art thou, whose daughter art thou, tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? Now you and I completely miss what's going on there, but she didn't. All right, we're going to focus in... Um, First, we're going to do the value of these things, because I know I like to know the value of things. So the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight. A half a shekel is called a becca. No relation to rabecca that we're reading about. It's about 6.02 grams. There are 31 grams in an ounce, which means if we take a fifth of an ounce, back then an uh, an ounce of gold was worth about $400 in gold. All right. So a fifth of that means that this this piece of jewelry was about eighty bucks. All right, um, that's a decent gift. Yeah, it's not bad. The bracelets, on the other hand, the bracelets were worth ten shekels a piece. And again, one shekel is equal to eleven point four grams. Remember, a half a shekel was like six, and here we're doubling it, so it's somewhere around twelve. Um, it's worth ten shekels. 10 shekels, this is one shekel, so we're gonna multiply by 10, and we're gonna say we've got 114 grams of gold. If 31 grams of gold is one ounce is equal to this, we do a little bit of fancy math, 114 divided by 31 gives us 3.67 ounces at nearly $400 an ounce. So these bracelets were about $1,400 a piece. Now that math, of course, is iffy. they're not around and we can't ask them. But what we do know is this was kind of a valuable present that he was bestowing on her. But the value was not what was important here. It's the earring, okay? So the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight. Look over at verse 47 and he says, and I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk a bear unto him. And I put the earring upon her face, and the bracelets upon her hands. Now, as I said to my daughter last night, <laughs> where did he put the earring on her face? Now, you and I think we put it on his earrings, and it's part of the face. So here's what I did. This word in Hebrew is a nezem, or nezem. All right, let's look at Ezekiel 16, 12. We're going to look at a couple of these. And wherever it's used, God kind of tells us what it is by the context. So 16, 12 says, And I put a jewel on thy forehead. The word jewel is nesim. So... He put the jewel here, it's the same word, on her forehead. Yeah. All right, let's look at Genesis 35. Doesn't require super glue. It can actually have a chain attached. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Genesis 35, 4. That's not what I read. Genesis. Earrings that were in their ears. Oh, I read the wrong one. Genesis 35, what? 35, 4. Right there. Oh, okay. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. So there's the same word, the same jewel, and God tells us it was an ear jewel. So Uh, really it's a face jewel, and where are you going to put it at? Exactly. Exodus 32.3 says, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears. Again, we know where that is. Um, Proverbs eleven twenty two. Uh oh. Yeah. This is our big study for the day. Proverbs eleven twenty two. 
is the one about putting a, a jewel in a in a pig's nose, and it says as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. So there it is, talking about being in the nose. And then Isaiah three verse twenty one. So this thing could have been anywhere. Isaiah three verse twenty one. <laughs> says nose jewels so it's a face jewel depending on where you stick it it's a face jewel and it really does depend on where you put it yeah now so there's again there if you want to take a screenshot and look up the verses later there you go all right now here it's put on her face it's an earring put on her face well sometimes it's earring and it's in other places it's a thing on her face it's a thing on her face now the word face is the Hebrew word for nostril, nose, or face. Most of the time it means nostril or nose. So here he's given her one jewel that goes on her face, and most of the time that word is translated nose, and he could have said he put it on her ear. The custom of the day uh -oh. was they would give an engagement ring on your nose. Oh. So, he shows up, he sees this, he starts bringing out treasures and starts putting... Now, he doesn't do it yet. He pulls them out. She recognizes that there are two bracelets... And an engagement nose ring. And an engagement <laughs> ring. Basically, if I pulled out a diamond ring... You would get it. Would you get would it. get it. I would get it. And he says, whose daughter art thou? Oh, look out. Now, do you see why that's important? Yeah. Because he's looking for Abraham's kindred. Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And then she says, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Mr. Bethuel, mm -hmm. the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. Oh, and moreover, she said unto him, we both have strong provender enough and room to lodge in. So here's what she does. Real quick, she gives her lineage. Now, I'm going to break this. Yes, she did. Upside down, she did. She gave her lineage because she knew that this was a marriage proposal. She probably recognized that there was Semite things about him. We don't know, but she probably said this looks like, a, you know, like maybe the way he was dressed or something. We don't know. But anyways, I'm going to show you this. This is so crazy. I bet you it was customary to do that when he was like, who are you? They didn't have last names. Yeah, they didn't. That's my last name. Yeah. All right. So here's Abraham and Sarah. Okay, this goes way back in all of our Bible studies. Tira had a wife. And Tira had three sons, Abram, which is Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Yep. And if you remember, Haran died. Yeah. Haran left three children, Milka, Lot, and Iska, which we've never looked at before. Yeah. Lot traveled with Abram, his uncle, into the promised land. Milka stayed behind and married her uncle, Nahor. Nahor took Haran's daughter, his niece, to be a wife. And they had Bethuel, Mr. Bethuel, who turned out to be the father of Rebekah and her brother Laban. So when Abraham said, take a wife of my father's <laughs> house, he literally, he meant, literally meant of my father's house. Small world. Tira. They did things different. It was allowed back then. This is before the this law. Is before the law, and the genetic pool was very rich. Tira had a second wife, which is where we get Sarah from, so that Abraham could say, Sarah is my sister, but of a different wife. Half sister. Yeah. So, and I left a big long line here because it took him a hundred years to have Isaac. Very good. During all this time of having Isaac, Nahor and Milcah have Bethuel right here, and then Bethuel gets married and whatever. We don't know his, his wife's name, but they have Rebekah and Laban. So now Isaac and Rebekah are going to get married, and they're going to be first their cousins once removed. So here we've got siblings getting married, uncles and nieces getting married, and cousins getting married, and that's where Jacob and Esau are going to come from. 
It is a family mess, by the way. This is, well, it's called Genesis, the book of beginnings. So that you can literally have every kind of beginning you want okay, in you this got book. It. Half steps, you name it. So, first cousin, second cousins, once removed, twice removed. So, it's, sh- yeah, it's a mess. We just got back from West Virginia. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we, we did, though. All right. It's got nothing to do with that. Yeah. So, now, uh, 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 let me back up again, because I'm still staying in verse 22. Okay. Came to pass as the camels had done drinking, the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight. That's what he's going to put on her nose. Interesting. Becca told me this, my wife. She said when she did a study on it, the the things were so heavy that they would pull their nostril down, Ugh. and they were compared to an earlobe, and that was another reason why it was called an earring. Just throw that out there. Can you imagine? Yeah, she's so fair. She's Don't been, put that on her face. It'll ruin her nose. She's been married a long time. How can yeah. you tell? <laughs> How can you tell? I don't know. <laughs> All right. And he put on two bracelets for her hands. So we say for her wrists. But bracelets went on the hands. And the hand went. Which is not here, but back here. Yeah. So we have a different standpoint. Now... The reason I bring that up is because is because in Luke twenty four thirty nine, it's important to let the Bible define itself. This is the way you're supposed to do it. <clears throat> Luke twenty four, Jesus shows up. Well, this was at the end of his ministry. At the end of his ministry, and he says to uh, I think this is to doubting Thomas, and he says, "Behold my hands and my feet." that it is I myself handle me and see because of the, the wounds in his hands, right? And when he had thus spoken, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. And there's another passage uh, in John. Well, I was thinking Zechariah, where, what are these wounds in your hands? Yeah, all right, there we go. So there's a lot of them. Matter of fact, I made a little illustration here. So if you put a nail here. Ugh, this is gross. And then you hung a guy on it, it would pull out from between his fingers. The skin just not strong enough. Skin can't handle it. So you got to have it goes in between the bones. You got to have all the wrist bones in the way. Yeah. Otherwise it'll pull out. So archaeologists they go, see the Bible's not right. It wasn't in his hand. Well, where do you put a bracelet at? On God defines this as the the hand. hand. So guess what? The Bible is right. That's right. All right. Same <sighs> thing with his feet, by the way. Same thing with his feet. Yeah. And he said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. And then she says, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. And she said, Moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. Now that was him saying, Hey, I'm going to try and engage you off. <laughs> and she says, This is my lineage. And you're welcome to do so. Yeah. And he bows his head and worship the Lord. Um, the worship is to fall prostrate. So he the collapsed. old man is at the well praying before God. And she's like, what? What? And he said, verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and of his truth, I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. A couple of things there. That doesn't mean, like, Nat is in my way if I try moving this way. <laughs> some, it, people, some people are like, if I just get in the Lord's way, he'll lead me. <laughs> that if, I just, if I just <laughs> hold on my hands and say, no, God, God's going to force me to do it. No, it means I was in the path the and road. I was moving. It's easier to move to yep. steer a rolling car than a car that stopped. Yes, it is. And so he's saying, I being in the way, I was looking. Yep. And the Lord helped me. Yep. If you're sitting on your rear end just praying about it, nothing will happen. That's right. And it says in the you gotta dam- put shoe leather on it. Gotta put shoe leather on it. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house. She just got done watering ten camels up and down her legs are shot. She's excited. <laughs> She ran to her mother's house. I'm getting married. To tell him these things. I'm getting married. Now watch, verse 29. And Rebecca had a brother, and his name was Laban, which means white, if anybody cares. 
And Laban ran out unto the man, again, the man, mm-hmm. unto the, excuse me, unto the well. And it came to pass when he saw the earrings and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well, and he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Laban likes money, by the way. We'll he find does. that out later. He does. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Now, a couple things here. Laban is the oldest son, and this is his sister. Um, Bethuel is still alive, but he's apparently quite old. So he is waiting at the house, and his son runs out. Yeah, Laban's doing the thing. Laban's, Laban's running everything, because you got to remember, that hundred years of Abraham before he had his kid, Nahor, if Nahor was still around, Nahor would be you know well over a hundred, too, because he was born before Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Bethuel, he's probably old too. Yeah. All right, verse 32. And I'm going to just read down through here because uh, we need to get through a lot of this. Hmm. And the man came into the house, that is to say the servant, and he, Laban, ungirded his, the servant's camels. And he gave them strong provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. Those were the guys with the servant. Mm-hmm. And there was set meat before him. In other words, Laban set a meal before uh, the servant, before his, his folks, to eat. But he, the servant, said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. In other words, he's faithful. i got to take care of my master's business before I take care of my own business. Ooh, boy, hear that. And he said, Laban said, speak on. In verse 34, he says, I am Abraham's servant. Now, of course, as soon as they mention Abraham, everybody knows Abraham. Everybody knows That's Abraham. That's the rich, 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 rich uncle who lives way over there. A thousand miles away. They've heard of Abraham. They've heard of Abraham. He's, He's the, blessed of God. Yeah, big. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. Right now, Laban is salivating. <laughs> and he has become great. And he hath given him <laughs> flocks and herds and silver and gold how and much men gold? servants and how maid much, servants how much and camels servants? and asses. Oh my! And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. Oh man! Man, that's a big, big Did inheritance. Did he hit the lottery? Yeah. Verse 37. Everybody knows Abraham's loaded. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. And everybody knew the land of the Canaanites. Mm-hmm. They all knew Canaan. Yeah. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, ta da, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure, the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Boy, Abraham can pray. He gets it right there and so can his servant. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred. And if they give if they give not thee one, if they get, don't give you a, a wife, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day unto the well. The well. I came I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee. A little water of thy pitcher to drink, and she say to me, Drink, both both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out of my ma- out for hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold Rebecca came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, not on her head. On her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and so I and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. 
And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Mr. Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk a bear unto him. And I put the earring on her face and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my father, master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter. Technically, it's his master's brother's granddaughter. But in the Bible, sometimes they leave off the word grand. They do. Unto his son. And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Unquote. A couple of different things I want to hit here real fast. Just so much. First off, the accuracy of this servant. He doesn't spin anything. This is a man who is very faithful. He tells the truth. It's chick, 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 the same thing. Chick, 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 the same thing. Chick, 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 the same thing. Um, and, and also, this is what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. Oh, I was going to do that one. <laughs> this is what it means. Yep. He I come, come, in my, come in the name of Abraham. O Lord God of my master Abraham. O oh, Father, I come to thee in the name of my Lord Jesus, your Son. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. If you want to learn how to pray, pay attention to this guy. Absolutely. He knows what it's about. Yep. And he got his answer, too. Yep. yep. Now, we have a greater name that we pray in. He yep. was praying in the name of Abraham. We pray in the name of God's own Son, Jesus. Yeah. This is a lesson. I don't have time to get into it, but you can dig around there. It's good stuff. Verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel, see Bethuel still alive, answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go. <laughs> That's my favorite. Take her and go. You know, it was easy to get a wife back then. Just show up with money. <laughs> and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. No, they, they just knew. They knew. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he falls on the ground again. He worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Yeah. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold. Now remember, we talked last week about chiclets. They would bring out silver and to test the quality of the silver, they would chisel off a piece to tell if it was soft or hard, to tell if it was pure or tainted. So they would always have these jewels of silver and jewels of gold. That's what it means. Teeny tiny pieces. Some uh, They look like little chiclets, some bigger, some smaller. But he basically, he unwraps the treasure for them. And raiment. And you got to remember, back then, oh, raiment yeah. was one size fits all, but it was rare. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it would have been Silk. silks and, and fancy things. Yeah. And gave them to Rebecca. Rebecca just got rich. She won the lottery. And this was kind of like, hey, this is this is a, a you know it's a like, foretaste. It's like trunkfuls, yeah, of stuff. And he gave scarves, and he gave veils. also to her brother Laban got excited, and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and they drink, and and he and the men that were with him, and they tarried all night. So this is one night. It's the next morning. They rose up in the morning and said. Send me away into my master. He learned that from Abraham. You get up in the morning, and you go do what God wants you to do. You get up in the morning, you go do what God wants you to do. And yet at the same time, he's a guest. Right. And, his, and her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that, she shall go. And I wrote down one for each camel. But that has nothing to do with anything. That's that whole... Anyways... All right, so let's just stay for a week and a half. I can see Laban. Mm, stay a little bit longer? Yeah, the longer, he's, the longer he's staying, I keep getting more treasures. Might get some more stuff? But he, the servant, said, Hinder me not, seeing that the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Now, this is important. She has a say. She's not property, and she's not oh being gosh, sold. Yeah. Okay, she's not being sold. Yeah, that thing is still saying a time over there. 8 o'clock p.m. So, so this is important to realize because a lot of ancient cultures back then, women were just chattel. Yeah. But if they came and they said they, they called Rebecca and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I'll go. 
and they so it's, it's like a soft arranged. Yeah, I mean it's not. Yeah. But she's got a say in it. She's got a say in it. She's like, you know what? This is going to be the best prospects I have. No matter what he looks like or anything, I'm set for life. You know, I mean, as far as that goes, she's going to be treated well, and that's important. Yeah, and and back, it's a hard life. Yeah, and they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, <laughs> and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate, that, hate them. And Rebekah arose in her damsels. So there's another little picture here. It wasn't just Rebekah that left. She had her nurse and her damsels, so there was at least four ladies that were leaving with them. Uh, her nurse was probably her nurse from whenever she was growing up. This would have been like her babysitter person who took care of her, basically. Um, uh, let me see here. They sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, Abraham's servant, and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said, thou art, our, thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Now that's billions. And this, I believe, was spoken by the Holy Spirit, yep. because this goes back to the Thou shalt be fathers, the stars of heaven, and the sand of the seashore, and everything else. Now, this is interesting, and, and I don't have time to go into it because I'm oh, rushing. Oh, money. And let thy seed yes. possess the gate of those which hate them. Mm -hmm. All I got to say is this. Uh, in in, in Ma Matthew 7, 13. <laughs> Matthew 7, 13. And you people might say, well, you're spiritualizing it. No, I'm not. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There is a gate of hell. In the book of Revelation, chapter 118, the Bible says that Jesus, he says, Behold, I hold the keys of hell and of death. That's called possessing the gate of your enemy. And they said here, And thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Nobody hates us more than the devil. And I know that I'm spiritualizing it and I'm reading into it, but I'm going to tell you what. The seed refers to Jesus, and we know what that gate is, and guess what? It's not prevailing against us, and I'm just... It's the gate of the enemy. I'm just running with it. I am verse, verse 61. It's a good lesson, and you know, that was a common prayer, because there were a lot of enemies, and if, yeah. if you didn't beat them, they were going to beat you. So you might as well go beat them. And if you possess the gate, you possess the entrance and everything inside. It means inside. you're in control. It means you're in control. Yep. Amen. Verse 61. And Rebe Oh, and by the way, her nurse is named Deborah. She dies over in chapter 35, verse 8, and they bury her under an oak tree, which is called the Oak of Weeping. You can look that up. It's true. But her nurse is Deborah. Yeah. Verse 61. And Rebecca arose. Oh. No, that's Dinah. I did the same thing. And Rebecca arose <laughs> and her damsels. You're right. And they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. And Isaac. Now Isaac had been down south. Remember how we talk about Canaan? Down south there was the desert country called the Negev. And that's where the well was at called Beer Laheroi. Okay. Isaac had came from the way of the well Laheroi, coming back up into Hebron area, for he had dwelt in for he dwelt in the south country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. So here they had arrived in Ur at eventide, and here he's getting back home at eventide. Some four months later, he may have to make the return trip. The man has just traveled twenty two hundred miles, and he only stayed in Ur. One night. He's no focused. sightseeing for this guy. He's faithful. Focused. Focused. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. That means he's going to think about the things of God. All right. David did it. Some people pray in the morning and some people pray at evening. Mm -hmm. um, just pray. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw and behold, the camels were coming. The camels were coming. <laughs> The plane. The plane. No, I was thinking about the British. The, the, the British are coming. One if I land, two if I see. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes 
And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. Now that's important because you never met a, a superior person from a sitting position. You would always come off and walk to meet them. So this was her saying, I recognize that you're my Lord. Yeah. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It's my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant, he stopped and he talks with Isaac, and he told Isaac all the things that he had done. And you know it was faithful. Yeah. In verse 6. And short. And short, because that's what he to was. To the point. And he goes, and here she is. He did, he did something like this. We traveled for six months. Then I went to this well. I, I prayed. I prayed. This is my prayer. Tick, tick, tick. He even pulled up the chart. Pulled tick, up tick, the chart. Tick, tick. We stayed one night. She said yes. We yep. came back. Yep. This is her. This is this is her genealogy. Yep. She's of the family. Three minutes later, the yep. trip was covered. Verse sixty-seven, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. Now remember, mm -hmm. the tents would usually have three chambers, two or three, and one of them was for the women, which would have been Sarah's, which is now empty at this point. Yeah. They had a caravan with all their servants, remember yeah. that as well. But here's this empty chamber in the big tent. So Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife. And we all know what that means. And he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Couple things I want to point out there just to cause controversy. There was no preacher, there was no vows, what? there were no wedding rings. She moved in and lived with him, and that was it, done deal. So what we would say today would be they need to get married and get right and have a Christian ceremony. But back then their culture was completely different. Well it was still one man, one woman for, for one for, life. For life. That's it was right. the commitment between them. Because if you weren't, that was considered harlots and all that kind of stuff. That's true. That's true. I just like to cause controversies and throw it out there. There was no preacher. There was no preacher. There was no vows. There was no family get-together. No. Nope. He said, wow, let's... let's." There was no chicken. <laughs> we had chicken at our house. I had chicken at my reception That's as well. That's what I'm saying. So chicken. The, yeah, no Marzetti. No, yeah. no Marzetti. <laughs> None of that. None of that stuff. Let's you, go ahead. You didn't tell us what Rebecca's name means. I, you know, I forgot to look it up because... Oh, no, I told her last time. It means hobbled. Oh, okay. So it's to be so... It's it's to stall or stop. It's the idea... Because my wife's name is Rebecca. It's the idea that you hobble a horse so it can't walk. And it's the idea that anybody who walks by stops to stare at her because she's just so good looking. She was very fair, is the Bible way of saying it. So uh, we had to rush through that one. There's a lot in no, it's it. good stuff. It's good stuff. I love my 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 favorite part is that just like he prayed in Abraham's name, we need to pray in Jesus' name. Absolutely, you, there's so many lessons right there. Tons of lessons. Be faithful, even if it's 1,100 miles this way, and, and you're 1,100 miles by this way, and you're tired, and all you've got is the initial word of your master. Get the job done, and then you can be done. Yeah, yeah, let's be done. Good guy, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for the book of Genesis and all the lessons in there. And thank you for all the wonderful things that you teach us through it. Um, God, what a great example. May we all be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 A prepared lady. Very prepared. God, I mean, God knew what was going on. Out of all the... God knew. Tons of people in the planet. God, he did not make a mistake. He did not make a mistake. God led it directly to the right one. Pinpoint precision.